While they, being the disciples, were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I have told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Once again, good morning, Christ Church. My name is Ryan. It's great to be in worship with, with you fine folks. I am not the normal pastor here. If this is your first week, I say this every time I preach. If it is your first week, come back next week. The preaching will be better, I promise. Um, but our, our pastor, Mike, is on a well-deserved vacation, and we have some other staff that are on vacation this weekend. They all work very hard and deserve, deserve breaks for sure. So again, my name is Ryan. My actual job and title here is creative director. Uh, I mostly lead worship in our modern worship on our band and, and do some tech things and media stuff. So um, enough about me. I'm not going to bore you with that. But um, let's talk about just, just some background stuff. When I was a kid, I was afraid of everything. Like everything. Was anybody that kid, like they were just scared of everything? And I'm not talking about normal things that kids are scared of. Like every kid is scared of like monsters under the bed and stuff. I was scared of, mu I was scared of much smaller things than that. I was scared of things like the buzzer at the basketball games we would go to because it was too loud and I would never know when it was going to go off. And then I would jump every time. Or like when I went to the movie theater as a kid, I remember like a little kid, I would get like a soda or like candy or something. And I would go to those little seats and I would always turn around and I would push him down and then I would turn around and try to sit in it and the seat was gone and I fell every time, right? And I was scared of those seats. Another thing, kind of for the same reason, I was afraid of escalators because I never knew when to step on them or when to get off of them and I'm going to fall and it's probably going to suck me in and all these different things that, that you think about, about escalators. Um, so I was thinking about that this week, and it kind of got me thinking about, like, official, like, phobias. I, I've never been diagnosed with any kind of a phobia. For the most part, I'm just kind of jumpy and don't like to be tickled. Um, but, but actual phobias, I thought, well, what are, what are some of these? And you, some, of the more, some of the more common ones we're going to go over today just really quickly. Let's have some fun. You, you, can, you can yell them out. Anybody know what claustrophobia is? What fear of small spaces? Yeah, like being enclosed in small Um. This, this next one we're going to talk about was actually a movie in the late 80s and early 90s, but I promise you I never watched it because I was so afraid of things like basketball buzzers that I would never in a million years watch a movie this scary, and it's called arachnophobia. Anybody know what arachnophobia is? Sphere of spiders, right. Um, honestly, I used to have nightmares from the Michael Jackson thriller video, so there's no way I'm going to watch a movie called arachnophobia where spiders eat people. Not going to happen. Um... Also, this, this is a really common phobia, but I, I had never heard the term for this. Um, anybody know what acrophobia is? Fear of heights, exactly, kind of like acrobat. Um, acrophobia is fear of, anybody here scared of heights? You might actually have acrophobia. I had no idea what it was. I don't really love heights either, to be honest with you. Um, and the last one we're going to look at sort of pertains to this morning's message. It's called agoraphobia. Anybody know what that is? Fear of crowds, exactly. Like fear of crowds, fear of people, fear of sort of open spaces. So people who have that really pull back and they like to stay in their homes. They want to stay away from people if you have agoraphobia. So moving forward, we are in the middle right now of our series called Encore. And what Encore is, it talks about the encounters that people had with Jesus after he had rose from the dead. These were kind of these bonus encounters that um, pe people got to see him and prove that he is, you know, who he said he was. 
And this morning's scripture that we've already read takes place just after the walk to Emmaus scripture. Just exactly after. And some of you may, may be familiar with the walk to Emmaus scripture. It's been a few weeks back, maybe a month ago, April preached that sermon. If you were here, to de- here you probably remember that. But just to kind of go over what happened in the walk to Emmaus scripture, Cleopas and his wife were walking to Emmaus, and this man comes up behind them, and they continue their, their talk and their walk. They don't really realize who it is. They get all the way home. Uh, this man's going to keep walking along. They invite him in because it's too much of a journey too far of a trip. Come to find out it's actually Jesus himself. When they get inside, they realize that. And then he opens their eyes to the scripture and their lives are completely changed. So at this point, Cleopas and his wife have realized that Jesus has resurrected. They've seen him in physical state. So when you have sort of a, a, I don't know if it's a secret, but when you have big news like that, you have to tell somebody, right? Like if you hear that, like you've got to, you've got to tell people quick. So what happens is Jesus leaves their, their presence, Cleopas and his wife, and that's where today's scripture picks up. Cleopas and his wife immediately go to find the disciples. They have to go find them. So eventually they find them in Jerusalem, and the disciples were behind closed doors. Because they were, just, they were just afraid. They didn't really know what was going on. Jesus had died. To their knowledge, they weren't sure if he had resurrected yet. There was kind of some, some hearings of things going on. But then Cleopas came and said, Jesus is alive. Jesus is totally alive. And at this moment that, that Cleopas and his wife are telling them this, Jesus just appears. Almost in like a spiritual sort of I don't know, ghostly kind of way just appears. But he's actually himself. He's in physical flesh and bones that he talks about. This morning's sermon, um, we, I actually decided, decided to title Hide or Seek. When I was a kid, I loved playing hide and seek. Anybody loved hide and seek? Anybody like that? Yeah, it's a fun game. Now, here's the thing. Here, where I especially loved to play hide and seek was in my own house. Because when I was in my own house, I felt like I had a home field advantage, right? Because I knew all the lay of the land. I knew which bed I could crawl underneath and which ones I couldn't. I knew which direction all the doors opened, which ones creaked. Don't step on that board because they're going to hear where you're at in the house if you step right here, so walk around that. There was this one little spot in our house where we had, uh, we had like a closet where two bedrooms sort of shared a closet. There was, a, there was an entrance, it's kind of hard to describe, but there was an entrance on, from both rooms, and if you kind of got between those entrances, it was like you weren't in either closet, which was a, the best place to hide in our house. <clears throat> but here's the thing. I didn't, I didn't really realize all these, you know, good details until I was probably seven or eight or nine years old, I would guess, something like that. I have a 17-month-old. His name's Clark. He's not, he's not here this morning right now. They, they already came and, and went to the 830 service and, and went back home. But he's just, he's just a little young to play hide-and-seek with yet. We're, we're learning some games, but he doesn't quite have that one yet. But I'm just going to fast forward a few months into the future. Has anybody ever played hide-and-seek with a toddler? Yeah, you got, I hear the laughs. Okay, so toddlers... Um, Here's a toddler's version of, of being hid. Their first move is they're going to walk directly into the corner. Doesn't matter if there's a plant there. It can be wide open. It could be that corner right over there. They're going to go walk into the corner. And then their next move is they're going to take their hands. And they're going to put their face in their hands, right? That's, that's what they're going to do. Like, so they're standing in the corner, the entire, the whole thing showing right there. But they're going to be like this. And they think they're hidden right? They totally think they're hidden. And you could stand there, you could count to 10, you could count to 25, you could count to 100, but when you're done, you look up and look left, right there they are. (laughs) Every single time. I'm looking forward to those days. Like I said, we're not quite there yet with Clark. We're doing different games. But I was thinking about that, and I was like, anybody ever tried hiding from God? I've done that before. I've tried. Um, I'm not very good at it, <laughs> to be honest with you. And sometimes I wonder to myself, uh, 
am I a little bit like that toddler in the corner if I'm trying to hide from God? You know, and, and even, even in times where I feel like I've succeeded in hiding from God, it's only because God's given me space. It's not because he doesn't know where I am. He's just like, I'm going to give him some time. He'll figure it out. It'll be okay. I'm going to, natural consequences are the best consequences. So I'm going to leave this alone for a bit. But it's not because he doesn't know where I am. Even when we think we're successful. And see, Jesus, the disciples were trying to hide at this point because they were afraid. And uh, Jesus, Jesus sort of just shows up, like we said, in the midst of Cleopas being with the disciples. And I wonder to myself, it says the disciples were afraid. I wonder if they were afraid because they felt like Jesus was a ghost, or I wonder if they were afraid because they feel like they had been caught. Because like, here we all are. Um, and Jesus comes in, they get right down to business. He was like, look, uh, yes, I'm real. I have flesh. I have bones. Do you have any food? I'll eat some fish. He eats some fish. Shows him his hands. Shows him his feet. So once they've established that we're, that we're talking to real live flesh and bones Jesus, um, he gets right down to it with them and almost immediately confronts them. And he says, we've talked about this, guys. You knew this was going to happen. We talked, it was written in the, in the law of Moses, which the law of Moses is the first part of the, of the Old Testament. It's also written in the prophets, the middle part of the Old Testament. It's also written in the Psalms, the last part of the Old Testament. We've talked about this. And up until now, see, there's so many prophecies about Jesus that were coming true as far as what house he would come from, what town he would come from, how long he would live, what his ministry would look like, in what ways he would die. And then there was also this detail that he would ri rise after three days, but the, it's like the disciples missed that part. Because everything had made sense until now. But it's like now, it's like, I'm not sure if I can believe that. Jesus is like, we've talked about this, guys, and, and here, I, here I find you, huddled in this room like it's a tornado drill or something. Why am I finding you doing what you're not supposed to be doing? I think sometimes that this can be true of, of the church as well. And, and I'm not talking about necessarily Christ church, but like big C global church. So many times we can be found playing it safe or we're just a little bit scared. So we're just going to stay huddled up here and we're not going to go face everything that's out there. We're just not going to deal with it. It's safer here. We know this room. The disciples think we know this space. We're going to stay right here. But see, it makes it hard to live out our calling to make disciples for the transformation of the world if we live that way. Six months ago, many of you probably won't remember this, but um, I, I don't preach here that often, so it's easy for me to remember. Um, si six months ago, I preached a sermon about how we are called to reach Davenport and the Quad Cities and the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Mike, Mike's going to mention the Holy Spirit in a few weeks, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. We have Pentecost um, Sunday coming, so I'm not going to step on, step on that sermon too much. But know that we can do these things through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the last of our passage, Jesus moves on, and he tells the disciples, once they figured out who he is, and once he kind of confronts them about this, that they're supposed to be preaching forgiveness to the entire world. And it's supposed to start in Jerusalem. You're supposed to be preaching forgiveness to the entire world, and it's supposed to start in Jerusalem. See, Mike and April and I have all preached sermons in this series, Encore. And the things that I see that continually come up across three preachers and across different messages are, one, that Jesus is who he said he is. He did raise from the dead. He, he was real. He did see other people. And the thing that keeps coming up is this idea of forgiveness. It just, can, it's continually there. And that tells me one thing, church. This is our first point this morning, that Jesus is serious about forgiveness. Jesus is serious about forgiveness. He's serious about us repenting and receiving his forgiveness. 
Mike preached a couple of weeks back that if someone from our past hurts us, he's serious about us forgiving them as well. We don't necessarily have to trust that person. Sometimes it's not in our best interest if something so bad happens that we just can't trust them, but we do need to forgive them, and through God, we can have the strength to do that. The part that I love from the Scripture, a couple of things. I love the little section. I'm not sure if you, taught, if you caught it, but he said that he opened their eyes to the Scripture before he talked about that. And I thought to myself, the reason why he did that, because you have Jesus, the physical embodiment of Jesus, standing in front of them, having defeated death in the grave. Talk about opening your eyes to the Scripture. When you can see this is the real, true, physical gospel standing right in front of me. And then Jesus goes on to say, he said that they are all, that we are all witnesses of these things. And we may not have ever been in the physical presence of Jesus as a human being, but I can tell you that if you have received his forgiveness, you are a witness of these things. You understand this idea of forgiveness in your life. Because you've been forgiven. And see, because we've been forgiven, we're not to sit behind closed doors in our comfortable churches on Sundays only. We have to go and preach this message of forgiveness and grace. We have to share it with others, which brings us to our second point, that it is difficult to reach others if we're not willing to leave our comfort zone. It's difficult to reach others if we are not willing to leave our comfort zone. And let me tell you something, church. I am proud to belong to a church that I believe understands this fact. This church gets this. So one of the ways, we, we as humans can have lots of comfort zones, but I just want to name one of our comfort zones. Um, one of our comfort zones, I believe, is a church is 2330 West 41st Street in Davenport on Sunday mornings sometime between 8 and noon. So in other words, this location, this time of week. This is our comfort zone. Look around. We, we're amongst friends. We know people. We see our walls. They look good. The, the music, the hymns. Steve up here giving the announcements and Sue playing the, playing the, playing the songs. And, and, you know, on some weeks, the handbell choir, some, some weeks, the chancel choir. We love these things. And these things are all great. They are so great. And it's part of what makes Christ Church what it is. It's part of what we love. These relationships are so important, and they are such a godly thing. They really are. Small groups, like Steve talked about, such a godly thing. But we can't just only stay in our comfort zone. We can't only stay in that. So the nice thing is that, is that Christ Church gets this. See, Christ Church can be found in more places than just 2330 West 41st Street in Davenport. Christ Church, I got to thinking about where Christ Church can be found. This week, here are some of the things that I came up with. Christ Church can be found in classrooms and homes and restaurants where our small groups meet. And Christ Church can be found on Facebook. Every time you check in on Sunday morning and we help, this month we're helping mothers with kids have meals. But every time you check in, Christ Church can be found there. Christ Church can also be found at the bedside of someone that's just had surgery as our Lifeboat ministry contacts them or their small group ministry visits them. Christ Church can be found in the classrooms at Buchanan Elementary. Christ Church is found on the hills of Los Cahabas, Haiti with RTS missions every time we send a team down there or we send resources year-round. Christ Church is found in our schools, in our work, in our homes. So let me tell you something, church. This church is succeeding at impacting the world. Absolutely. There is no doubt in my mind that this church is making a difference in the world. Which, which led me to, to, to look at myself and think about something else this week. If this church is succeeding at reaching the world, am I individually doing enough? Am I, am I doing enough? Um, at, at, at this point, I've been on staff at Christ Church a couple of years. I haven't been to Haiti yet. Not yet. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of other things that I can do. Sure, I'm busy here through the week, but, but there's other things that we could all be doing. 
And it's not enough just to sit under the umbrella of, yes, I go to this church that does all these awesome things. Think about how much more we could do if we had more help, more people that were willing to preach this message of repentance and forgiveness. So I asked myself, so, so why aren't I doing more? Is, is it fear that's holding me back like the disciples? Because the reason why they weren't out preaching forgiveness at that time is because they were afraid. So I, 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 have, to, I have to say that if it is fear that, that's holding you back from preaching this message of forgiveness, God can help you step away from that. God can help you step away and overcome these fears. I have to ask another question. Is there someone that you need to invite into our process here at church? have a friend or a family member you can invite to small group or you can invite to Sunday morning worship or you can invite to a revive event that we're doing because here's the deal we've already established that we are making a difference in the kingdom of God but it's not because we are the answer the reason why is because Jesus is serious about forgiveness and he is the answer Jesus is the true, real answer, and this church is providing people with the gospel in, in new and relevant ways. I have dear, dear relationships in this church, people that I would do just about anything for, and I'm confident that they would do just about anything for me, relationships that I value as much as anybody on earth, but church, we're not just called to be an exclusive club. We can't be just that. It's good to be, but we can't be just that. We can't be. We have to invite people in. See, the disciples, while they were sitting in that room scared, they weren't doing the kingdom much good, were they? They were just kind of there. See, we gather in this place on Sunday morning to leave this place and to go do battle for the kingdom. Let's agree that we're going to do more of what Jesus is calling us to do. Let's just agree to that. That we're going to do more of this idea of preaching repentance and preaching forgiveness to other people. through our. Maybe it's through words. Maybe it's through our actions. Maybe it's just a, hey, come to church with me. Let Mike preach that to him. But we can still do that. Let's stop hiding and start seeking. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for this truth, Lord, that you've given us through the word. God, we thank you for Jesus and his example, God. We thank you that, that he rose from the dead. We thank you, Lord, that he loves us enough to be able to challenge us, Lord, in areas that, that we need to grow. And we thank you, Lord, for um, the good that we are doing through him, God. Lord, we ask that you would just search our hearts this week, God, and we pray that you would give us opportunities, Lord, to, 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 to preach the gospel to people, Lord, through whatever mean, Lord, that you make possible. It's through your Son we pray. Amen.